Good afternoon and welcome to the third in the six-part series from MicroFocus on enabling us to better understand enterprise security. What is it? Where does it fit in? What happens when we've been hacked and how do we avoid that in the future? Well, talking about being hacked, today we are joined by Andrew Whitaker, who is the Sales and Services Executive from Altron. And I'd like to say thank you for joining us today, Andrew. It's a real pleasure to have you on our podcast. Before we dive into the meat, before we dive into the meat, 17 years you've been married to Altron. Where did you start? <laughs> what was your first job there? Hey, Daniel. And thanks very much for having me. Really appreciate it today. Yeah, 17 years. It's been a long time. And uh, obviously, cybersecurity has evolved tremendously in those 17 years. In fact, uh, when we started at Ultron with cybersecurity, it was actually automating mundane IT operations actions um, and trying to reduce the manual overhead. But reducing manual overhead started meaning taking out human errors. Uh, and eventually, we realized that actually what we were doing is improving security, reducing risk, and ultimately helping organizations govern um, you know, you mentioned Ultron. Ultron made an acquisition of the company that I've been part of for those 17 years, a company by the name of Abusha. That acquisition happened in March 2020. Um, and Abusha, over the preceding years, since the early 2000s, um, had been focused on how we manage people and their access to IT systems. So you can imagine you typically approach that from an automation perspective, but much later on, with the advent of international legislation like Sarbanes, Oxley, and others, um, they became very real security and governance requirements for managing who has access to what. And from there blossomed a range of additional services that we offer for managing people and their data now with yeah. the advent of Popea. Um, and in, as I said, 2020, Ultron was on the search for a strategic entry into the security market. There was lots of different security capabilities within Ultron as a group. You know, we're a big global mm. group, mm. large global system integrator. Um, but we didn't have a dedicated standalone security practice. It was sort of foundationary in all of our different opcos. And Ultron wanted to consolidate that into a central capability that would lead the charge for security across the group. And, and Abusha was a great way for them to, to do that. So they acquired Abusha last year in 2020. I'm very excited to also tell you today that we've just concluded this week our acquisition of Law Trust. Um, and together, Abusha and Law Trust create one of the biggest security capabilities in Southern Africa um, for managing people, access, wow. security. Wow. Uh, it's really going to be an exciting journey going forward, and we're excited for ourselves and obviously for the opportunity presenting to Ultron. Amazing. Congratulations. That's always Thanks. brilliant. And I hope the cultures get to meet. I mean, that's the most difficult part of this is just getting the cultures to fit. Do you have a strategy around that that you would, uh, that yeah. you would use in, as an executive? Interesting that you mentioned that. Very interesting that you mentioned that. You know, when um, Mr. Ntetu and Yati, who's the CEO of Ultron, approached us, um, back in 2019 to begin discussions around our acquisition, um, the very first thing that was on his mind and ours was culture. Because exactly as you say, mm. culture is a thing that's going to make or break an integration. Um, we, we spent a lot of time in our due diligence of each other, taking a look at the corporate fit between Abusha and Ultra. And it was exciting to see uh, in Tetu's vision for the One Ultron strategy mm. um, and putting the staff, the people, and the culture first. And it, mm. it resonated very strongly with our drive as well. And equally with Law Trust, um, through the acquisition process of Law Trust, that's something we've put first and foremost. Abusha and Law Trust have always worked very closely together in the past. Cybersecurity in South Africa is a really close knit family of people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think there really is a really good cultural alignment. But, you know, the pressures that we have in this country around cybersecurity skills, they're so portable, they're so in demand globally. Um, you, you know, you've got to put the people that work in your company first. And now that everyone's working from home, um, mental health, thinking about wow. people and their approach to the work and the job that they have um, is things that we've never really had to put foremost in mind. And, and, and those are the things that we've been grappling with over the last three months. I, I think you've hit the nail on the head. We are grappling with these things. And as executives, sometimes there can be a divorce between you and the real world. How do you stay in touch with what's going on with your team? And uh, do you have any advice on that for other execs? Yeah, I didn't introduce myself. So my responsibility at Ultron Security is for both sales and services. And that's an interesting dual responsibility. Mm. 
Um, and that's because what we sell from a cybersecurity perspective is never in a box. It's not shrink-wrapped. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no one size fits all for a customer. Um, almost always, these solutions are bespoke, involving some level of technology to assist us with automating the security control that we want, but also a lot of people to be able to embed that security control. Mm -hmm. Initially mm -hmm. in the implementation process, the business change management, but also in the long term to actually operate these security controls. You know, this is not... Um, email security we're putting down, uh, the kinds of things that you put in place when you've been breached, uh, typically mm. require fine tuning over time and administration mm. configuration. My responsibility is not only to lead the sale of that, but also the successful delivery of that at customers. Um, and that keeps so you're myself invested. And my team. Exactly. You're invested. So myself and my team need to be involved with the customer, understanding their requirements and seeing those through to conclusion. Now, we've spoken about culture and you spoke about it quite passionately. You look after the skills, you look after the people, you're probably interviewing a couple of people, but then you're going to the front line and, and into customers as well. Do you see the cultural culture come out quite strongly when there has been a breach? And can you point out when you walk in, can you see, oh, oh this is a little bit toxic or wow, this is, this is good, this is healthy? And what are the differences? Yeah, you, you hear a mantra that cybersecurity professionals, chief information security officers often say, which is prepare that you're already breached. You know, don't plan for the breach, prepare as if you already are breached. But I, 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 in my experience, often when you arrive there, you typically see people deer in headlights. You know, <laughs> most people are bewildered at that time. Um, <laughs> especially, you know, in, in mid-tier South African corporate world, um, these things are complex. These challenges are, are, are very difficult to grapple with. And whilst there is um, most recently a lot of attention at board level on these topics, mm -hmm. I think many organizations are still trying to play continuous catch-up. Um, mm -hmm. The IT landscape evolves so quickly. You know, we, mm -hmm. it was only four years ago that people seriously started looking at migrating to cloud. Today, everyone's working at home. Everyone needs to access cloud services. It's an absolute mandatory requirement across corporate South Africa. That's only been 12 months that it's been like that. If you're making changes that quickly to an IT environment, um, it, it's very difficult to keep up with the security elements of it. So I think most people, as you say, are caught unprepared, even though they wouldn't like to be. Mm. Um, but look, I think the aim of the topic today is to um, get across how a couple of logical steps of making sure that your organization continues to function from a mm -hmm. business perspective mm -hmm. in this situation, making sure that you understand what happened and make sure that you communicate timelessly as required by legislation. And then looking back and figuring out what you can do better are really just the simple steps that any company needs to take to get out of the, get out of the situation. Um, and, and we're lucky in South Africa is that we have some really mature companies that are able to hold your hand and get you through it. Yeah. Uh, Ultron security is one element of that. You know, we there to help you ensure that you have lasting change in your organization and the right security controls to see you into the future. Uh, but we have other organizations that we partner with that can help you with the communication mm. or the forensic mm. analysis immediately post breach. Mm. So let's go into that. So what are the immediate next steps? We understand there's a breach. It comes out, someone knocks on your door and says, oh, gosh, the, the Huns have got past the gates. Now what do we do? And, and maybe we can categorize that into two different paths. You know, there's the catastrophic attack where damage has been caused and your primary concern now is about continuity. And I'm thinking about some of the recent ransomware attacks that we've seen that have taken, for example, the South African ports offline yeah. for days on end yeah um, and then there is perhaps the more common data breach um, okay. perhaps one individual with too much access made a mistake and his endpoint got compromised and that happened to have some customer sensitive personally identifiable information on that perhaps the 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 blast radius is far less but equally there could be certain legislative requirements so there's different okay. paths that you would follow but i think no matter the path that you're going to follow on yeah, your first and foremost concern is going to be on continuity, right? We need to keep the ship on course. Yes. Um, yes. So if there is a very large blast radius in the attack, certainly we're going to be implementing business continuity processes to ensure that the company can continue to function. Um, beyond that, then, you know, we need to, especially considering legislation, now with the advent of Pope here, 
things are serious in South Africa, right? You lose someone's data, you need to tell them and you need to tell them timeously. And there's a regulator that has teeth that's going to impact your business if you don't do these things. So you yeah. need to understand what happened. Yeah. Once you've understood what happened, you can make the right decision um, based upon, you know, if information in fact was stolen. Um, and then beyond that, we can now start thinking about the long term. You know, how do we prevent this from happening again? What are the lessons learned? Um, our organization, Ultron Security, help, helps with a range of these security controls to make sure that we manage people, their access, and know what data we have in an organization. I think we can unpack those perhaps a little later. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think in the immediate response, ensuring continuity, understanding what happened, and getting your communications handled according to legislation are going to be your very first priorities. I wrote it down as, as block intrusions, but if they happen, continue to function, identify where it happens, report on what happened and reflect on why. And well, I think that, that sums up what you've been saying here. If I bring yeah. you back for a company that, that is operating and, and we, you know, we've just got around the fact that we need a SOC or a, a security operations center. We've got some budget that's going on. Do you give a paint by numbers a, a, a plan that they can follow a breadcrumb or is everybody making up their own response plans that are out there? Well, I think, as I said earlier, there's really going to be two responses. One is for that very large attack, which hopefully okay. is coming few and far between. And typically this is going to be a state sponsored or highly funded attack okay. um, for a very particular purpose. Or there's the data breach, which is, far, far more common. And I think according to those two paths, absolutely, there is a cookie cutter approach to follow for those. Okay. Um, many of this can be done by yourself, okay. um, making use of your own internal services. Um, but where required, there's great partners in South Africa that can help guide you through each phase of those. Typically, those partnerships, I mean, I'll give a shout out to SensePost. We've used them recently in a breach. Great South African company, now part of our cyber defense in Europe. Um, and they have, um, you know, some fantastic forensic analysis services available. Um, I, maybe I can give you this example. Yeah. I'll mention customer names here. Yeah. But um, we recently had a customer that phoned us up on a Monday morning to say, unfortunately, um, one of their developers has come to work this morning, told them about this ransom note that they found inside of a database that they were using on their laptop for development purposes. They'd taken their laptop home. They were working from home. Um, probably didn't think too much about what they were doing, but extracted a production data set of customer information, was working at home on this. And when they woke up the next morning, the database was empty and there was a note left in the database saying, uh -huh. I have your data, please deposit this many Bitcoin in this wallet. Um, now, obviously that is of significant concern. Yes. Additionally, it wasn't their data. This was a company who was delivering services for a multinational company. Oh. And many of these citizens were European citizens. So this wasn't just Pope Pia, this was GDPR, GDPR. European privacy mm. legislation, which carries as much even more teeth perhaps than mm. the Pope Pia legislation. So they need to make some fundamental decisions. Do they communicate this to the customer? How quickly do they do that, et cetera? Um, so we needed to understand what was happening. So you know, we partnered um, with our good friends at SensePost who were able to help us with the forensic analysis on that laptop. Um, at the same time, we gave them some good advice about you know, get your communications done, um, which they did, um, and informed the chief data privacy officer um, wow. at that organization. Um, and whilst the investigation was happening, held back perhaps on informing the regulator and the data subjects um, what was amazing to find is that this is a very common tactic. This is the new ransomware. Call on legislation, make people petrified of the fact that they're going to get a GDPR or a Popea fine. At the end of the investigation, taking a look at all the ISP logs and what was happening on the network card of that laptop, nothing left that laptop. Uh, the laptop was port scan, some um, default username and password were used to log into the database. The database was dropped by a script and a message was left. And, and this was probably being done at scale across the internet. No one actually knew what was there. Wow. There was just a hope that maybe there was some GDPR sensitive data. Um, so, you know, understanding what happened is vitally important and knowing if the data was stolen actually or not uh, yes. can, can make a significant difference to your attack. So there's specialists out there in terms of forensically understanding what occurred. There's specialists out there in terms okay. of your communication strategy, both to data subjects, because obviously in South Africa now with the advent of Popea by law, if you um, have a breach and lose someone's personally identifiable information, you do need to inform them. 
Um, and then, you know, obviously to your stakeholders, right? Yeah. yeah. As a board, they're going to be very concerned about this. Um, but yeah, there's good partnerships in South Africa to be able to help companies that can assist you with that. And obviously from Ultron perspective, we can look beyond there and see what are the things that you really should have had in place to prevent this in the first place. Yeah. Andrew, that is amazing. I, I really enjoyed the fact that you are, are, are highlighting specialists in specialist areas. Um, so it's not expected to be a one-man team. Yeah. Who pays for this in your, in your world? Who pays for the cleanup, the oil spill that's happened? Does it sit at the sea level? Is it sitting in IT? Is it sitting in security? And who do you traditionally report to in the customer? Who does your team report to? I suppose there's two kinds of um, buckets of organizations. There's those that have a dedicated chief information security officer function. Okay. And typically they'd play an interlock up to the board, um, feeding everything to the board and then representing back down to the various stakeholders inside the organization that are going to be involved in remedial activity. Um, obviously, the security office in that situation would carry the funding for that. Okay. Um, but obviously often out of budget funding would need to be made available from the board. Um, we, I think we'll talk about, you know, more medium term remediation. Yes. Yes. Um, that learning and, and that, that kind that of learning. And, and, mm -hmm. and we're seeing a lot of that happen in South Africa at the moment without a breach actually occurring in the first place. Awesome. Um, Brilliant. The boards are playing a very particular attention to a number of critical security controls that needs to be in place. Um, of course, there's also the mid-tier organizations who don't necessarily have that chief information yeah. officer role. So in those situations, you know, there's typically going to be a, a committee for risk and governance um, coming from the board mandated by a number of executives. So people like your chief information officer and your CFO. And typically in that situation, you know, they'd be involved. But, you know, those are the organizations that are going to need some handholding through these mm. processes. Again, mm. you know, the, the skills are available in South Africa. A lot of very mm. experienced individuals um, that can guide you through some very mm. tactical steps mm. to get it done. So, um, Andrew, it's very, it's very tempting. I know I'm staying on course because we're talking around a topic, a breach has happened, and what do we do here? But if, if you had to have three items on that IT security strategy document, what would those three items be that would prevent a breach happening? Sure. So first and foremost, if we look at a breach, no matter the breach that occurred, the commonality that we find, the weakest link in the chain is you and me, Daniel. It's, it's the people in you the You know company, me right? so well, so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but but for, for, for a long time... Um, we've complicated security, thinking about a plethora of security things that we need to have in place. But you know, first and foremost, the people that are making use of IT need to be informed, need to have awareness campaigns of just the importance of their username and password, right? Then, then beyond that, um, we can look at a number of security controls that better manage what access those people have. Because that's who the bad guys are coming after. They're coming after you and me. They want our usernames and passwords. And once they got them, they get some level of access. Okay. The first thing we need to do is make sure that that is the most minimal amount of access. Okay. So we need to have a concept of least privilege in an organization. And we need to have some kind of identity governance platform to be able to get line of business to, on a regular basis, pay attention to what their direct reports have. You know, okay. IT can't possibly be responsible for managing who has access to IT systems because what on earth do they know about the business people that work in an organization and what kind of access they need? Yeah. So security should be providing the business processes to line of business that they can know what their direct reports have and always be making sure that that's really of the most minimal. Mm. If we're doing that, then the second thing that we need to do is worry about all the systems you'd be blown away to know that, you know, 50% of user accounts and access in many systems aren't for the people. It's for an application to log into its database. Yeah. You know, if you unpack okay. Microsoft Active Directory, guaranteed 50% of the stuff in there is for backup 01. Yes. And no one knows who's got that username and password and guaranteed it can read every file and every oh, file wow, server. Right. So we need to worry about those guys as well. So security controls like privileged account management tools which are specialist capabilities to be able to lock away the username and password of these um, shared accounts. DBA admin one star. 
and putting it in a little vault. And if somebody wants it, you can check it out for a time period. Yeah. But if something yeah. bad happens, we knew it was Daniel who had that yes. username and yes. password at that point in time. So really, those are two critical controls. Identity yeah. governance, privileged account management. Got to have them. Um, for a long time, we've seen auditors uh -huh. arrive at organizations and say, tell me why this user account exists. Uh, because it looks like this person's left the company. Yeah. That's a common audit yeah. test that's been performed yeah. for the last 10 years. Everyone has sorted that problem out. If it's manual or automated, it's sorted out. Today, the audit queries that we're seeing are far more intelligent. You know, yeah. Why has Andrew got this access? Who approved it? When was it yeah. last approved? Yeah. You, you, need, um, you need systems in place to help you manage those processes. It's not good enough to be able to do them paper-based anymore or in the Excel spreadsheet. And, of, and obviously, the, the, these these, these highly privileged shared accounts, that's the gold. That's what the attackers are after. And if you look at almost every single ransomware attack, if you take a look at that example that I gave of that data breach, that's what happened. It's yeah. a privileged account. Yeah. It's a DBA yeah. account. It's yeah. default username and password. You didn't have the good hygiene on those accounts. This is difficult because today we don't actually know where all the databases are. You know, you've got developers in Azure spinning up databases with a click of a button, with no central approval anymore. Mm. Um, but again, the security controls that we have mm. and our sponsor Microfocus has provides great capabilities to discover these accounts for you mm. and to automatically get them under control. Mm. So those are the two things I think that are perhaps most important. Okay. And in fact, privileged account management is what we see most organizations go to post-breach. The okay. very first thing that they do is realize, oh, my word, it was the DBA account that we left lying around that someone got access to. So now let's lock it away. Uh -huh. So PAM is typically the very first thing that we see organizations implement post-breach. The third thing, if, if, if you'll allow me one last point, yes. is data privacy. Um, now with Popia, it's even more important for us to understand where we are storing personally identifiable information of the people that work with us, third parties, and customers. Okay. And that sounds easy because surely it's in a database, but you know, we're at home, we're working on Microsoft Teams, we're building content in Word, in Excel, we're storing it in Teams, which is backed by SharePoint online, online. so now it's in the cloud, and very quickly we lose sight of the fact that those Excel spreadsheets may contain a credit risk analysis of mm. all the customers mm. that we have. Mm. So having good unstructured data governance hygiene doing regular scans of unstructured and structured data, mm. knowing where personally identifiable information is, so that when we go back to the beginning and we ask what access does Daniel have, it also extends down to what access to personally identifiable information does he have in content that was created in places like Excel. But I mean, it sounds like a lot that I've said there, but really those are three things in three steps. Yeah. We need to manage yeah. our highly privileged accounts, top of the pyramid. Mm. One level below, we need to know about all the people that work for us, what user accounts they have, their associated access. And we need to know that that's valid for their current business role. Hmm. If someone goes and fishes an employee, we want to make sure that they have the least possible access at that point in time. And then lastly, we want to know where all the personally identifiable information, because in South Africa right now, that's highly regulated. Uh, and if we lose that stuff, that's where we're going to have to go through some significant communication change management. You know, uh, it, in another life of mine, we do that for SMEs and how many have got no idea. And, uh, you know, they, they just don't understand what privileged information is. So I, I, I support you on that 100%. Um, yeah. Andrew, what is a commonly held belief about this role that you play that you passionately disagree with? Sure, you said you were going to throw a left field question. Um, I, I think um, there are many organizations in South Africa that are um, technology resellers. You can go to them to get a shrink wrap box, like I mentioned in the beginning. But the reality is that there is no one size fits all solution in this space. Um, and the partnering, the strategic partnering that you have uh, with a customer or with a service provider is absolutely essential. Um, yeah. The cultural fit, we talked about it earlier, yeah. you know, inside of a company, but even when creating a service provider relationship, the cultural fit needs to be there. You need to understand each other. You need to understand each other's goals and 
desires from the investment um, to be able to actually achieve a sustainable solution. So I think one of the misnomers in these roles is going back to you know the 90s of selling IBM equipment. Yeah, we're all box droppers. Yes. We, yes. We, we want to make sure that you you buy, buy, buy. But but you know, the reality in this industry today is that these things are expensive, the investments are significant. Mm. Um, and our community is really small. Um, and and word of mouth is vitally important. Um, and if you are not delivering on the value and ensuring the long-term sustainability of these technologies. Um, and that's a common problem. So it's really it a is. common problem that we see in cybersecurity. We talked mm. about the skills gap. Uh, it, that's a global problem. You know, there's not enough cybersecurity resources in the world. There really mm. aren't. Some number of great initiatives in South Africa, one of them spearheaded by ABSA, one of our customers, to create from the ground level up cybersecurity mm. skills. Mm. But nonetheless, they aren't there today. Um, so mm. often the security capabilities that we implement um, struggle a year down the line mm. because they need to be oil. They need to continue to function. Mm. Um, and our customer organizations many times don't have those um, skills themselves. Mm. So something that we've been grappling with for the last two years, and I believe we've got right, is to find um, price appropriate capabilities for organizations, both in the mid tier and enterprise sectors to be able to get long-term viability, sustainability, value from these technologies. I love that. There's my soundbite. Price-appropriate capabilities to add value to your business. I really like that. Uh, you know, in, in, can, I, can I add one point to that, Daniel? If yes. you'll allow me, I mean, value. Security has been a grudge purchase. It's been a grudge purchase forever. How do you yeah. sell someone on the risk of this conversation we're having today? Yeah. happening you yeah. know it's a horrible yeah. way to sell it fear is. uncertainty and doubt it's the yeah. old insurance yeah. way of selling right yeah. but but you need them so the balancing act that we need to have in cybersecurity um, is how we create value mm. with these cybersecurity mm. controls and mm. and 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 there's many ways um, that we can do that so mm. there's there's a big drive at the moment for passwordless authentication it's a new topic mm. that's mm. come about in the last 12 months mm. but just think about the passwordless authentication value proposition where a person doesn't have a username and password anymore you want to yeah. log into your computer you have a biometric a phone and a qr code on your screen and to log in you scan the qr code yeah. put your biometric on your finger and you're logged in yeah. now this is great for the workforce it makes a good workforce experience yeah. it improves security because you can't be fished anymore your credentials yeah. can't be stolen and don't let me going about the customer use cases because yeah. when i now start rolling this out to the consumers of the service we're selling it's a far better digital experience for organizations so value-based selling not just resolving yes. risk really yes. is the in cybersecurity. Andrew, um, where do you self-educate? Where can our audience get to your level of understanding of this marketplace and what to do after a, a security breach or about security in general? Yeah, um, I, I, suppose, I suppose three things. Firstly, in the cybersecurity space, we've been blessed with a number of non-vendor technology-specific um, certifications and accreditations, okay. things like CISM, and obviously the much larger certifications like CISSP, et cetera. Um, those foundational security capabilities are, are vitally important. It may be contentious. I know a lot of people think CISSP is something of the past perhaps, but the, the knowledge required in cybersecurity is vast. That's one of the reasons it's such a difficult industry to get into because you need to understand the difference between a database in Azure versus a database in Amazon Web Services. You Absolutely. Know, the these things is vitally different. And yeah. just understanding those concepts are, are massive technological hurdles for people. So we are lucky that there are some great CompTIA and CISP-based uh, foundationary educations that you can take. Um, and of course, you know, platforms like Udemy make these very affordable to be able yeah. to self-learn those concepts. And then the internet is just a wealth of knowledge, um, okay. being able to research these topics. Yeah. Uh, there's something I'd like to mention at the end that really wraps up, I think, everything that I'm talking about, which is zero trust security. Um, but before I talk Go. about zero trust security as a topic, talking yeah. about education, you know, it's fascinating that the US Department of Defense in February of this year put together a white paper on 
the reference architecture for the US federal government on zero trust. Yeah. And zero trust encompasses what I consider all of the critical security controls that are required in the modern organization. If you really want to try and not have a breach happen, uh, it means knowing about identities. It means knowing about who's got access to what. It means managing privileged access, understanding your data, understanding data flowing in your organization. It talks about all the great concepts. And the US federal government wants to implement zero trust. And they've built this architecture. So if anybody wants to do their own research on many of the topics we talked today, go and look at the US DOD Zero Trust Reference Architecture published in February of 2021. Um, and it's a long document, but I mean, it breaks in really simple terms, a vast series of concepts and links them together into a very easy to digest for executives, uh, managers, and technical individuals on how to implement these capabilities. Um, so they exist. They're out there on the internet. Mm. You don't, don't even need mm. the certifications. Um, there is open source knowledge out there to be gained. Well, a a Andrew, I've also read on the internet that the earth is flat and that um, they saw an angel flying down William Nickel. So, you know, you got to, you need guidance. You need guidance yeah. around that. And I really like the credibility that you're adding to it because it comes sure. from the DOD. For a young person who's coming into this market, who is... Um, tech savvy because they've grown up with it now what advice would you give to them to get into the space that can they can be a useful asset to an organization in a security space what what what's your elevator pitch for getting into your area and what advice do you have for them um so twofold um firstly great decision I and mean, this absolutely <laughs> is the most <laughs> high-paced frenetic, innovative industry that you could possibly get into. So I love that. if you're even thinking about it, I strongly advise to do it. Secondly, we've spoken many times now in this, this chat about the skills gap. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a place that desperately needs the right-minded individuals. And then lastly, this is something that is clearly a priority for companies like Ultron, for companies like the banks in South Africa, and all of them, us included, are running um, very structured graduate recruitment programs and even internships to be able to take individuals with the right entrance criteria through a structured learning approach over a 12 month or even longer period with on the job training at customers, at banks, to be able to really get that experience mm. to be able to promote yourself as a cybersecurity practitioner. Um, as I said, you need a vast set of experiences. And a lot of those experiences really are gained, you know, on the ground, mm. learning from the situations as they occur. Um, well, what I did they say? Is running a cyber what did they say? Experience is what you get right after you need it. That's uh, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, there you go. You were it's talking about marks, hey? exactly. You were talking about ABSA there, yeah. but I, I actually wanted to yeah. stop you because. I wanted to say, I hope you are doing a tour of high schools and talking to kids about how amazing this industry is. And if you're not, I think that you should be because um, people don't even know about the, the, um, the wealth of sure. opportunity that's out there from a security perspective. And as we were saying in the preparation, the fastest area growing in IT today is security. So we are coming to the end of our time together. I want to ask you three questions. I'm going to, um, um, I did pose Rapid them earlier fire. for our audience. So he has had time to think about it, even though they're cool questions. Um, Andrew, mm -hmm. what is the most exciting technological release that's coming in the next six months? What are you anticipating to, to be released? Um, so I can tell you what we're working on currently inside of our organization. Even better. Um, Go. So I, I mentioned this concept of zero trust. You know, zero trust is about making sure that every person behind every transaction, we know who they are. So we give no trust until we know who the person is. So we need strong authentication. We need to ensure least privilege. We need to manage the accounts that are highly privileged in our organization. These are all things we do today. Zero trust also talks about managing data and data privacy. And these are things that we're doing today. The thing that we are currently not doing today that we are wanting to take to our customers mm. is how do we all of a sudden provide a perimeter where someone is trusted and someone is not trusted. In the old days, if you plugged your laptop into the network, it meant you were inside the building. You had an access card, you got mm. into the building, 
So we trusted you. So if you plugged your laptop into the network, you had unfettered access to the network. That, that's not possible anymore. People are at home, they're accessing SaaS services. How do we create that new cloud edge that is the modern perimeter that provides all the old security concepts that we're used to, things like web proxying, things like data leakage prevention, things like mobile device management, but doing it in a SaaS way that is on the internet, that is cloud-based, and that allows us to take a lot of the cloud services that our workforce want to access and make them dark. Mm. And the only way we can get access to them is through our corporate perimeter that is hosted on the internet or all over the internet, available globally. People were trying to do this with the concept of VPN many years ago. This is the modern evolution of that. So um, we have three practices in Ultron security, our identity security practice, our data privacy practice, and most recently, our cloud edge security practice. And I'm really excited mm -hmm. to see how that's going to evolve over the next few years. Outstanding. That cloud edge, are we talking about edge computing? And we're talking about IoT and security all around there. Wow. New discipline, new podcast. We can't talk about it now because we have a great day. Wow. That is exciting. I want to know more about that. I'm a robotics fan. Um, I just think automation hasn't even scratched the surface of potential and uh, edge computing. But uh, when, when, this is not about me and my passions. My second question for you, Andrew, as sales and um, services leader, we're leading up into December. What is your focus and where are you directing your team for the quarter to bring this year home? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're blessed in cybersecurity that we have probably quite a different challenge in the COVID-19 pandemic, which is there is a lot more work that needs to be done than anticipated. So for us at the moment, it's about finding new ways of working, improved ways of working to be able to deliver on the demand. Um, so much changed in the last year that cybersecurity initiatives and organizations are playing a lot of catch up to be able to put the right defenses in place. Uh, so for us, the challenge that we have at the moment is to be able to support our customers best and to be able to deliver on uh, the project requirements that they have for us. Um, so I think it's, a, it's an excellent position to be in, to it have is. the demand, but it's also a double-edged sword. You know, the, the, the ability to deliver on these um, is not readily available. So we have to think of new and innovative ways to work, new and innovative ways to partner with our customers to be able mm -hmm. to help them. Mm -hmm. So those are our fun challenges for mm -hmm. the rest of our financial year. Ah, stunning. That's very nice. And I know both Ultron and Microfocus have got quite an exciting grassroots partner development program. Um, I was chatting to one of the, the partners who's privileged to be on that that um, journey. And I just wanted to shout out to yourself as Ultron and to Microfocus for investing in South African growth companies and these smaller companies that are coming through, having a big brother like Ultron Security really means a lot to them. So um, that just came out of nowhere. I just want to honor you for that and say well done for spending time on developing small businesses. My last question to you, Andrew, before I let you go off onto this fine uh, spring afternoon or summer afternoon, um, if you had to give advice to a security person in an organization that's not lucky enough to have Microfocus's technology or Ultron security to put it in place, how would you say to them, deal with their breaches effectively in a headline statement or at least an elevator pitch statement yeah in the famous words of douglas adams don't panic <laughs> step one um there is a there is a logical sequence of tasks um at the same time breaches happen uh, i think you know a month doesn't go by where we don't see someone in corporate south africa having this happen um, make sure you understand the legislation and your obligations under legislation like popia of notification of data subject um, data subjects. And, and lastly, um, spend the money on understanding what happened because it's not always at face value um, immediately um, visible what occurred. So Excellent. spend the time to do the forensic analysis, understand what occurred, and then you know, take the necessary appropriate steps. Um, the, the, the companies that will partner with you from a forensic analysis perspective will typically give you that advice as well as to the path that you should be on from a communication strategy. Excellent. Andrew, thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Um, thanks for your wisdom. And thanks for bringing us back on track so often. I really appreciate it. it. It's a difficult one because 
I know that you can prevent these breaches if you talk to someone like yourself and you put the right safeguards in place. But being able to respond in a logical, um, calm manner is maybe when people should really reach out and speak to your team. Any last words before we end this session? Oh, I really appreciate it. It's been a lovely conversation, Daniel. Thanks very much. It's such um, and obviously pleasure. also thanks to Microfocus. You know, we've partnered with them since the inception of our company. So we've been around 17 years and we've been wow. partners of Microfocus since. It's been a wonderful journey to be partners of them. And I'm very grateful for them organizing this series of podcasts. It's very informative. I'm enjoying listening mm. to them. So thanks to them for that. Thanks, Andrew. From my side, Daniel Robus, it's really a privilege being on this uh, Microfocus security journey. As um, the least IT aware amongst all of the participants, it's great for me to know about these things. And what I've really taken about out of today's session with you, Andrew, is the emphasis, emphasis is on don't panic. You have a plan that you can execute. And if we take anything out of that, that would be outstanding. So to all of our audience, we are going to go on to um, episode four quite quickly, but we'll let you know more about that in the next one. Andrew, thank you for your time. Have a great afternoon and bye-bye.